The production of this video was made possible by donors to the Orchestration Online Patreon Initiative. Please consider adding your support to the creation of free educational internet resources by visiting our Patreon page linked below. Hey there, this is your orchestration tutor, Thomas Goss, welcoming you, after that long introduction, to the first of three lectures covering my orchestration of Andaluza by Manuel de Falla, which of course was the selection for this year's orchestration challenge. Now I am actually recording these videos before I've had a chance to look at any entries, so I just want to assure everyone that my version is not influenced by anybody else's. 
And indeed, I orchestrated this a month before I announced the challenge. In previous videos like this, I've gone into some detail about the context of the piece and chatted randomly about this and that, but I want to stay more focused on the actual material and the challenges that it represents. So let's just focus on that, and I will leave it to you to look up Manuel de Falla's biographical details, the situation under which this particular movement was composed as part of a series of movements from one collected work. As you may recall, the announcement video had some pitfalls, and one of those was tempo. I will be playing you back the piano version of this by the pianist Peter Bradley Fulgoni in a few minutes, just to demonstrate some of the things I'm talking about. And you'll notice that it is faster than the orchestral mock-up that I just played for you. But the other pitfalls that I mentioned in that video don't appear quite yet. This video is only going to take us to the end of section B. And then after that, I'll show you how I solved some of those problems myself. So let's start at the very, very beginning. And I'm just going to outline all the challenges that I saw in this section. First of all, the pitch weight is in the upper middle register of the piano. What I mean by that is most or all of the musical pitches are weighing down on that particular register. And in the beginning, it's really just one octave from B to B. And then things expand outwards as the music progresses. But it never gets lower than D here, and then middle C there, and then all the way down to B here. So really, we don't see a bass staff until right here. That means that there's a risk that the orchestration of this will be stuck in that area. And while that's a beautiful place to be in, it kind of limits the scope of the orchestra. There will be less of an expansive feeling right when you need it at the beginning of a work. Now, I'm not denying that that limitation itself could be interesting, but I want something bigger at the beginning. So that is one of my challenges. Then the next possible problem is that we have the repetition of this little rhythmic idea over and over again. Bium, 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 bium. Dun, 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 dun. And that just repeats four times throughout this entire screen. So if I keep that approach all four times, then I run the risk of just sounding like I've copied and pasted the same exact material and that we're just kind of running around in circles. So part of my challenge is to make these two lines of music sound differently when they're orchestrated. A third problem, this little melodic development that follows each of these opening four bars on these lines, really reaches quite high. Here we're seeing it reach all the way up to this ottava D, which is just about as high that particular area right in there, D, E, maybe, maybe even all the way up to F, that's about as high as you would want to score the average first violin part for a moderately skilled orchestra. And indeed, we get all the way up to E right in here. So that's all pretty much acceptable, but it has a kind of a shrieky quality, especially when you are pushing things. You're already fortissimo, and you've got a crescendo, and you've got this accented staccato right in here. So how do I orchestrate these upwardly reaching lines right in here without them getting too shrieky? Another problem is this left-hand staccato accompaniment figure. And here, of course, the staccato is maintained by most piano performers, so you just assume it's going to be the same. And, of course, the staccato continues on here. You might have noticed in the Alicia de la Rocha 
performance that she threw in a little bit of legato right in here. And that's perfectly fine. And it's a good contrast heading towards this marcato staccato passage. But the real problem here is not the staccato, it is the really wide range in that accompaniment. So we're going all the way from E to B. So if you're using a wind instrument to cover all of these notes, then you'll notice that they change registers no matter what you do. If you use a flute, you start off in the weak register and you end up in the strong register. If you use an oboe, you start off in the generous register and you end up going a little thin but still nicely done. And for clarinet, you're starting off in the shallow register, hitting the throat tones right around this A and so on, and then ending up in the clarino register. So if you want perfect evenness of tone, which you may or may not, then you have to consider some of these particular things. Now notice that we really have two eight bar phrases here and the second one ends up very very high here on these octave E's but there's no relief no contrast of registers when the piano jumps back down from this height it's still the upper middle two octaves of the piano starting from this middle C going up to C and then E above it's still focused on the same area that we started out with so how can I maintain the interest of the audience staying up there? And then how do I transition from there towards this lower register convincingly? And how do I maintain this driving staccato right in here and transition smoothly? So all of those factors were things that I considered when I sat down to orchestrate this particular section. Let's have a listen to the piano version of this. Think about all of those things that I mentioned, and then I will talk about how I solved those problems in the orchestration. for my take on that same section and as we plow into this I really recommend if you have got a smart TV that you watch this on the YouTube app and just blow it up to whatever size your screen is and it makes it so much more readable now let's take a look at the actual orchestra that I used and I held to the same exact limitations that I set for everybody in the events announcement on the orchestrationonline.com website. Starting from the top, I've got two flutes plus third flute playing piccolo. Here the piccolo comes in at the beginning, so I have the piccolo line and mention that it doubles flute three. There was a little confusion about this in the Music Engraving Tips group. Somebody had asked a question about where the piccolo should be sitting, and I think that they were worried because they had a separate staff for each line, and they were thinking maybe about the flow in Dorico or something like that. And so it was a concern whether or not piccolo should appear below the flute line or above it. And my approach is just to have the piccolo line above the flutes and then below the flutes when the change is made to flute three. And that's pretty standard. Two oboes and then the third oboe player is playing English horn and doubling on oboe d'amore. And that is a choice that I made for a specific moment that will happen later in the piece. So just for now, think of it as mainly an English horn player. Here we've got two clarinets in B flat and bass clarinet, and it's 
just the most wonderful instrument to use, especially for a piece like this, as you may have noticed in some of the passages in the mock-up. Two bassoons and contrabassoon. I actually don't use contrabassoon as much as I would like to. I often don't really see the need for it in my scoring because I'm not constantly pushing at the basement in a lot of my textures. I feel that that is something that is needed for specific kinds of scoring when you are opening up the scope. But a lot of times people really kind of get stuck in that basement and they don't really know how to balance the entire sound picture. So things end up sounding a little bit too heavy. So I do like to score Contra Bassoon, but I try to limit it a bit and just choose it for exactly the right moments, even if those moments are just like a note here or there. Four horns in F, three trumpets in C. I try to give the third player enough to do to justify their existence. Two trombones, and I really tried to make sure that I had enough in here to justify the existence of the second trombone player, but I'm afraid that that is the instrument that is probably the most underscored in this piece, is that uh, second trombone. Bass trombone, tuba, timpani, and here I've got tambourine and bass drum, and I actually have not that much percussion in this particular orchestration. I'm sure that I'll see quite a lot more in other interpretations as I go through the evaluations, and that's perfectly fine. But I just felt that aside from a few specific moments here and there, it didn't really need a lot of percussion. Of course, some glockenspiel here and there, perhaps some of these lines will be orchestrated for Celesta in other entries. Then harp, here I have just boiled it down to one staff because I need the vertical space. And then standard strings. And here I've included the piano staff, though you do not need to do this in your own evaluations. You can delete the piano staves or hide them just so that there's more vertical space. So having covered that explanation of the orchestra, Let's take a look at how I solved some of these problems. Now, some people might be wondering, well, the whole problem of the grace notes at the beginning, isn't that something that you would worry about when you were setting this up? And I didn't really consider that to be a problem. I considered it to be kind of obvious uh, what to do. Of course, I've got that same left hand scoop up from the F double sharp to the G sharp right in here. And then I've got, right here you can see the piccolo playing C to B. This was actually a question in the orchestration online group, whether or not it was B to B or C to B. And here I think that it's perfectly fine to slur down from C rather than just having that B tie over on a grace note. It really is kind of confusing to have a tight grace note just before the beat. It's almost better to have the notes not tied and have the person going BB, 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 rather than B tie, right? Because that tends to throw off the rest of the orchestra. Here you can see the slur uh, from the E down to the B right in here, which really is providing most of the propulsive motion. And then a lot of this is just doubling, really. First, clarinet doubling the piccolo. I think that that's a really powerful doubling. And these Bs right in here, this is sounding B written C, are going to be doubling these trills. And notice that I'm just using the inverted mordant sign or the trillo sign. So I just want dia, dia, dia. And I want the trill to be an aspect of the accent, right? I want it to be a punchy twist right on the attack of each note. So that is going to come through here with the first violins, the two flutes, of course, with that trill. And then, of course, that is also doubled by piccolo and clarinet, but they are basically just providing 
the kick off from the grace notes into the note. So right in here, just to focus on those problems that I set myself, you'll notice that I really do play by the rules of what Faya has laid down at first. I really keep all of the pitches right up where he says to keep them. However, once I get to the middle of the second bar, I have got this snap pizzicato in the bass. And so that is kind of our first sign of something pulling downwards from the original score. Now, of course, the snapping sound is going to be even more trebly than the rest of the music that's happening here. Now, you'll notice that I've got the melody in the first violins and in the first flute, and then I've filled in some of the harmony here with the oboes and second clarinet and so on. And I've got the trumpets playing muted, and they're going da-da, 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 da-da. And then tenuto on beat two at the same time as the snap pizzicato and these tremolos in tenor clef cellos. It's, I just feel that that is a cool way to interpret this. Now, I am doubling my violas with English horn, and I've got this, and then pizzicato, pluck, 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 pluck. Over on my video that I released, 12 Common Scoring Errors, somebody made a comment underneath it, a violin player, I believe, to try to not have pizzicato and arco constantly follow each other. And I think that it's fine in moments like this to just jump from pizzicato to arco, just so long as you're not doing it constantly, right? Now, having said that, you can see this entire line, but this is something that the players can practice up. It's not such a crucial thing. And also, there isn't really anything in this that is all that difficult for the left hand to finger. I feel that that is part of the problem, is when you have the left hand doing kind of complicated things, it sort of distracts a little bit from the player's sense of where they are, and it just becomes part of the confusion that's going on. So just try to have your scoring be kind of typical and kind of easy to grasp if you are jumping back and forth between pizzicato and arco. But oftentimes when I've got chamber music, I will try to leave more generous gaps because it is harder for the player the individual player of a string part to hide some of the jumping around, some of the readjustment. A lot of times you'll have the uh, pizzicato finger playing along and it's right up against the bridge and the, uh, the little gap between the bridge and the fingerboard and it's right in position if the player is still holding on to their bow for them to hit something with a nice down bow. So I would say to try to keep it really, really simple so that the bow is in the position to where the player can just go straight to pizzicato. Now, of course, that's a lot to think about if you don't know that much about stringed instruments. And that is a good reason to try to keep things kind of simple in the way that the Boeing and the pizzicato is. But what I've scored here, you know, looking at this as a violist, I think I would not have any problem doing this if I were in practice, so. Probably noticed some tambourine. I think people, when they first looked at this, some orchestrators who wanted to avoid cliches thought, oh no, I must not score for tambourine. I think Faya would have probably thrown in some tambourine somewhere in an orchestration of this piece. So 
One of the problems that I mentioned was to keep the two sections, the two opening eight bar sections from sounding identical. And here you'll see that the basic orchestration is the same with a couple tiny little changes. Like right here, we've got uh, Divisi octaves in the violins and the violas not changing to pizzicato right in here, which they probably would appreciate. <laughs> And then the English horn taking over on that lower octave with the flutes doubling the lower Divisi violins. But I have added that weight right in there to keep things smoother because I'm adding an octave jump up here with first trombone and tuba. And then landing right here on the second beat of the second bar of each little phrase on horn. And I feel that that really gives it a lot of nice weight. And of course, that's all being doubled by contrabassoon and then bassoons on the tuba line and timpani on the downbeat right here. That really gives it a punch and kicks off the rest of each two bar phrase. Now, notice that right there on that middle beat, every other bar, I've also got a bass drum stroke, but it's mezzo forte. It's not intended to be very loud, it's just emphasis. I want the whole sense of a grounding weight to be right here at the beginning of the first bar, and then just a little bit of push right in there, not to feel that it's coming from below and really pushing downwards. Here, I'm leaving off the snap pizzicato and letting double basses help out. Now, something you'll notice about the double bass part is that I have scored it in tenor clef. And uh, some people are probably going to quibble about that, but I've got to say, it just really is something that a concert double bassist will have to learn to read. So it's kind of not worth complaining about. Now here, notice that I have divided up a lot of these accompaniment figures. Remember I was talking about how this was another problem that I had to solve. E octaves, then E, B, and then B up an octave, and so on. And that if you were to interpret some of this across the scope of a wind instrument, you would be changing registers and so on. So. I do <laughs> cross certain registers here, starting in the Chalamot and then jumping up to the Clarino register and so on. And that's perfectly fine for a clarinet player, not a big deal. But notice how I divide things up here. I've got bass clarinet playing an octave below the oboes. And then I have the English horn coming in and grabbing that third note of the bass clarinet and continuing on with it. And that is playing an octave below the clarinets in B flat A2. So here I'm expanding things outward, just adding an octave below. And we're also seeing that in the viola and cello pizzicato and second violins in arco staccato. Now, comparing that to the second half of the second section, I kind of preserve some of that approach at first, but I've got some place to go, don't I? So adding a little bit of push here from my horns and then ending here, bang, with uh, snap pizzicato, here on this E fifth, really, really fun to do for our cellos. And of course, on this written E right in here, don't forget that we're still in tenor clef for our double basses. A very, very high note snap pizzicato on double bass is not quite as resonant as a lower note and especially as a note on an open string. So watch out if you use that. I give my 
trumpet players a couple of bars to take their mutes out. Not a huge crisis because they can just reach around and pull them out. It's not quite as arduous as in some other instruments, removing and putting on mutes. So they all end together, bang, right there, and that kicks off the upward reaching staccato. Now, remember that one of the problems I had to solve was getting too high. And here you'll notice that just for those top few notes, I jump up to piccolo and then have the first flute come in and double on the way down. And that way it's more seamless coming back. Now this A here, jumping up to the D, is something that I avoid right here in the first violins. I play the A, but then I jump down to D. And then I grab that same A on the way down that the first flute is playing. And the resonance, the overtones from the first violin right in here is enough to provide the illusion that the firsts are doubling the piccolo on the way down. Now, the second time I go up, of course I've got octaves to score, and that actually helps with the illusion. My first violins are running up the scale, they get up to this A, and then jump down an octave to B, and so on, and end up on the same E as the seconds. And notice, as this progresses, the violas come in under, and they are playing essentially a triple octave, which turns into just a double octave when the first violins drop. And the violas are actually being doubled by the trumpets. So the trumpets are going to kind of overwhelm the sound of the violas to a degree, but it's better to have the violas in there than to not have them there because they moderate the sound of what's going on there in the trumpets, even if they can't be a forefront sound. Here we've got the clarinets doubling the second violins and there's no compromising needed whatsoever. Here we've got the Atu oboes doubling what's going on with the violas and the trumpets. That also helps to mellow or moderate the trumpet sound. And actually, the blending of the oboes with the violas gives that string sound a little bit more strength. So it's a nice combination. So you'd think that the oboes would blend with the trumpets, and they do to a certain degree, but they also help to carry forward some of the projection of the violas, or blend with them enough to preserve their sound, or to conspire with their sound to a degree. Of course, it depends on your oboe players, <laughs> and Atu oboes are going to have a more kind of focused and direct and less sensitive sound. Now here, I am pulling some of the same stuff with the flutes that I am with the violins. So Atu flutes right in here, plus piccolo, they're all playing the same notes. And that kind of weight right in here is going to carry forwards in the perception of the listener. So it's a psychological thing. So. I'm not going all the way up to this top E with all of the flutes. Obviously, the first flute and second flute are going to run out of steam if they try to do that. So I take the flutes as high as I think I can comfortably go, which is up to this C for the first flute and the second flute dropping down when it gets to the B. And then A2 again on this D right in here. And the overtones from first and second violins and the flutes A2 is enough, I think, to 
add to the illusion that a bunch of instruments have run all the way up to this high E. Now, getting everybody into this position, I continue on from that point with the flutes on top. So, notice this was one of my problems that I mentioned at the beginning of the lecture. What was I going to do because the third line that you saw in the piano continued to stay in that upper middle register of the piano. So how can I stay up there and not overdo it? How can I provide some kind of variety and contrast? Well, here we can see that this was uh, a very mixed kind of a sound. I had strings and winds doubling a lot of parts. I had a little bit of weight below that from my muted trumpets and so on. Now here, I have got basically a wind sound. So I keep the focus on the winds with a little bit of doubling of staccato, bass clarinet and bassoons with pizzicato, violas and cellos playing octaves right in there. And I feel that that gives me enough of a contrast going forwards. And it's also much less tone weight. Here, I drop down to mezzo forte subito, so I would just have somewhere to go, right? I've added a lot of dynamic nuances here and there. And I've held back a little bit on the added brass just so that it didn't overwhelm everything. And in fact, I downplayed the dynamics right here in the trumpets as well. So my strings and winds could be fortissimo. My brass is just a little bit at a distance. That's okay, they're gonna be loud enough. And then right in here, I had my horns playing mezzo forte, crescendo to forte, and then letting go. And then immediately there's a dynamic drop and then a push up to fortissimo, and then a drop to forte. And when you get to that point, you can actually hear the glockenspiel doubling the A2 flutes at pitch. And actually, that's an interesting combination. A2 flutes, as opposed to just a single flute, doubling at pitch with glockenspiel. I feel that that mellows the sound. If there was any kind of unevenness from exposed A2 flutes, which generally not with pro players, but it's just a trick that you can use. Of course, if you're working with players who really are phasing and kind of far apart in their intonation, playing these high notes and doubling with glockenspiel, then you get an entirely different effect. But generally, the glockenspiel will pull everything together and make things sound very sweet. Of course, this is a very, very short little stint, just two bars of Glock. And after that, I get into this trading off right in here. And that is how I solved yet another problem. And that was how to get from this section, which stayed focused on the middle high register of the piano, downwards to this driving staccato. So how I did that was to just trade off between sections of the orchestra or between timbres, really. I mean, yes, that involves trading between sections and that is the most brutal way of doing it, but I still have some doubling here and there, right? It isn't just winds, then brass, then and so on. So starting off more wind focused with a little help from pizzicato strings and glockenspiel and then trading to arco strings and then going to brass right in here, first trumpet carrying the melody, and then the horns backing up just a little bit. Now notice that I don't complete the trumpet right in here, landing on this note, because I feel that's just too much weight. I just allow the pizzicato strings and the first clarinet plus bass clarinet to provide the completing note, which would be a D, right? Written E here for the first clarinet. So here's where we get into what to do 
with that driving pizzicato. And I decided to keep it really simple. And I'm actually really interested to see what other orchestrators will do with this. There might be any number of different strategies, which is always really fun. I'm not saying that I couldn't think of anything better to do here, but I looked at those few bars that lead down to bass clef finally, and this is what occurred to me, was very, very simple. A first violin doubled by first clarinet, not A2. I think that's too much weight from the winds. And then second violins doubled by the violas, and those are in turn doubled by the bass clarinet, really giving the bass clarinet something to do throughout this arrangement. Now that continues on wending its way downward, and I have to say the clarinet is absolutely the perfect instrument for this kind of scoring. Just covering those registers really, really nicely. Same thing with bass clarinet. And right in here, I just trade off to bassoon and the bassoon is going to become part of the accompaniment strategy going forward, as you can see. Meanwhile, violins are just a perfect little transcription of what's going on in the piano in terms of pizzicato interpreting staccato piano. Continuing on these harmonized staccato notes right in here, when we get to this bar, the second violin part doubles the first violin part and the cello comes in to double the viola part. Because obviously there's crescendo and we want it to be fuller and everything else and we're preparing to go to a different kind of texture coming up. Especially with the fullness of tone that is implied by the piano right in here, that is something that you might want to go for. Now, I've thrown in these dashed diminuendos because that is something that you'll hear in most piano interpretations. The pianist backs off after their wild ride through all this harmonized staccato, and they're going down to more of a mezzo forte or poco forte kind of an expression right in here. So I'm interpreting that as mezzo forte. And we will talk about section B in a minute. So now that I've discussed all of those things, let's jump back to the previous page and have another listen just to that section, section A to B. Now for section B. I actually find this to be a really thrilling part of this piece. I love the harmonic motion, how we have settled on A, and the A is also a bit uncertain, but we somehow inexorably come back to the tension of E, right? That's that that very Spanish thing of using E major as a kind of jumping off point to a lot of different places because it's the basic tuning of a guitar. The fullest chord that you can play on a guitar would be the E major chord. And of course, it's a great flamenco key and the tension between E major and say F major, uh, that kind of uh, Phrygian sort of idea. We see a lot of that right in here. Okay, so without getting into the harmony, let's just talk about the scoring problems. And one of those is just, I'd say, basically overall, uh, I have to think about contrasts of color and uh, the breadth of the texture in middle register scoring. So, in other words, everything really is staying in the middle of the piano. We had a lot of stuff in the upper middle register of the orchestra. In other words, the two octaves from middle C to two octaves above that. 
now we're seeing things really kind of stuck right in the very middle, centered around middle C, and then of course digging downwards as we get towards the end of the screen. All right, all well and good, but I just don't want to end up being stuck in the middle there texturally and just sounding very ordinary or just kind of losing my sense of being thrilling there. I, the music is thrilling me. I want to be thrilling in my orchestration. So contrasting the color and having a consciousness of not getting stuck in the middle is really important. Now, along with that comes maintaining differentiated roles in very closely spaced melodies and overlapping accompaniment figures, right? So we've got a lot of melodies that are right there in the middle. We've got a lot of harmonies that are very close in. We can lose the sense of melody if there isn't a differentiation between the texture and the roles and so on of the different instruments that are this close together. So in a sense, this scoring is just as tricky as the previous section. There are going to be some places where I really want to highlight some of those inner voices, and you'll see how I do that in a minute, if you don't remember from the beginning of this video. And then there's this other problem, and that is that the left hand leaps up to play these E's above whatever else is going on. So here it's on the second beat of the second bar of this screen, and then here it's on the first beat of the fourth bar, and here it's on the last beat of the sixth bar. So it's really not falling on any particular regular place every other bar, but shifting around just depending on the availability of the hand, right? And where uh, Faya wants to put his emphasis. Like right here, he's carrying forward that idea of landing in the middle of the bar. Bum, 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 bum. Whereas right there, da, 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 da. We have this little E jumping there. Then here, ba, da, 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 pow, da, 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 da. So right in here, he's just accentuating the beginning of this bar and the peak of the melodic curve. And then we're coming back to it. And it seems to me that that second beat is accentuated with lower tones. And then Faya throws in this higher note, just because he can, and then jumps back down again. Some nice acrobatics here for the pianist. So my problem here with scoring these is so that they aren't all the same and they don't all just feel like this beep. Because the orchestra does not have that same continuous moderated sort of timbre that the piano does. So little notes like this can really stand out and become kind of glaring by the time you get to the third one. So that is something I'm trying to avoid. And there's even a little bit of that right in here with this E third. Then from bar 33 on, we've got these lovely triplets. But the interesting thing is that they are somewhat melodic and they're somewhat gestural, right? So here they're melodic because we're finishing this little line. This goes G, A, B, right? And right when we hit the B, we got this diam, and it sort of serves as a bit of a counter melody. But this really is the melody right in here. E, E, G, F, E. We've got that same tension, right? E major. The, the feeling of E major, but also using the F. That sort of Phrygian second right in there. And at the same time, these little triplets continue on as little figures. So I have to be careful not to allow the triplets to overwhelm the melody, but to not push them down into the background so far that they lose their spice, right? I just really want them to, to be active parts of the overall functions of the music right in there. 
And then, of course, we've got the problem of these bass notes right in here. So obviously cellos cannot reach this low E, and double basses are a bit, you know, they're able to play this B with no problem, but it just really is kind of a lot of jumping around. Interestingly, this E is an open E, so if you need to score something where you're going fingered E, fingered B, and back to E, and then just an open E below, that is not too hard, but it is a bit acrobatic for the player, as it is for the pianist. A lot of this piano playing is built right into the hand. Uh, Faya knew what he was doing when he asked the pianist to do certain kinds of gestures. It really does fit under the hand of an accomplished pianist, as opposed to just being awkward no matter how good you are or how bad you are as a pianist. On top of all of that is keeping the textural contours fresh and not too much the same going through all of this. So how do I solve all those problems? Think about those problems that I just outlined. We'll listen to the piano part again and then jump to the orchestral score and talk about some of my solutions. now for the orchestration of B. So I'm going to talk a lot about the problems of contrast of color, breadth of texture, differentiated roles in closely spaced melodies, overlapping accompaniment figures, and all of this middle register scoring and how to solve those problems. Okay, but first <laughs> I'm going to talk about the E's, those little E's that pop out here and there. So how did I deal with them not being too invasive, not being too repetitive, not just hammering at the ear after the third time? First, I start off with glockenspiel in octaves and then an octave below, <laughs> the first violins, tremolo, and that is my first little ping. And then yeah, ba, 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 da, 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 right on the da, da I've got flutes playing this tremolo right in here. Notice I've brought flute three in. So I've got flutes one and two playing a little bit lower. I've got flute three on the upper note right in there. Okay, and they're all sort of playing this flutter tonguing right in here. And that is the same pitches being played here as fingered tremolo in the first and second violins. And at the same time, that catches this harp glissando right in here across these chords. And, of course, this is going to be part of the English horn solo right in here. Just a really, really good pairing off of instruments. English horn and harp work really, really good together. And here I'm stripping back this texture to almost nothing, right? So it's just da, 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 the English horn being accompanied by harp and a little bit of tremolo flutes and violins. And just a little bit of unmeasured tremolo here at the end uh, as the bassoon and bass clarinet come in. Okay, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Then, this was the second little ping right here, this E up here and the uh, little chords beneath it. And then the third little ping coming on the third beat of the sixth bar of B. That was, once again, same instruments, so it isn't glaring. I actually orchestrated this initially and I experimented with having high strings all three times. I had the first and second violins up an octave and same thing with the flutes and I just decided it just sounded bad and then I dropped it an octave I thought about it for a little bit and that just sounded really good internally and then of course externally on the mock-up it sounds pretty good too so then right in here do you remember how I mentioned that at the uh, beginning of the seventh bar 
there were also some E thirds. So I threw them in right in here and made them work with the harmony, adding the C below here in fingered tremolo in the second violin. Now that is leading to a further discussion of what is going on here with these cascading downwards little harp arpeggios. And I feel that that's just a natural outgrowth of these higher notes and also trying to keep these little triplets from becoming banal, from becoming predictable, right? So I threw this in here, definitely a gesture that you would expect from Faya. There are some similar kind of downward cascadings that you hear in some of his other piano writing, especially, I believe, in Nights in the Gardens of Spain. There are a few gestures like that. So I bring it in here, and then I continue on with the triplets, and the triplets become a contrast to the harp, rather than just being something on their own that gets boring after a while. I mean, notice how long I'm maintaining them in the violas. Okay, but I don't keep the doubling in clarinets the entire time. Here I allow the first clarinet to sort of speak out. It is going to be probably the stronger part of this combined texture with violas. And then right in here, bassoon becomes the partnering instrument. And of course, second bassoon on the double stop right in there. And then coming back to clarinet, and then the viola is continuing on by themselves. So you can see throughout this, I have kept the triplets from becoming too predictable just by changing around the doubling and alternating them with these very kind of spine tickling downward arpeggios. And then right in here, I brought in a doubled oboe and English horn with a harmonized downwards cascade in the first and second violins. And I feel that's really in keeping with Faya's orchestration. And then continuing on with our triplets and so on. So that answers some of the questions, some of the other problems of how to keep the triplets interesting. While we're on that topic, we're going to sort of do this evaluation a little bit backwards. We're already talking about how I treated this section, right? So let's stick with the accompaniment for the latter part of B and talk about how I divided up the lower part of the left hand, the little jumping up and down staccato, right? So sticking with pizzicato, right? and letting the cellos take the E, B, E, and then the double basses to just go E, E, and to really hit that lower E nice and hard. Now, obviously not a snap pizzicata because that would mean pluck snap, and that's unpredictable. You don't know what speed the conductor is going to take it at. So if they decide that they really want to go uh, 66 to the dotted half note, then the basis would be in trouble if they had to jump to a snap pizzicato. Snap pizzicato is something that you sort of want to have a fraction of a second to set the hand and, and to do the plucking and not to have too many in a row either. It's a semi-isolated effect and one that you shouldn't just jump around, you know, jump down to a quick snap pizzicato. Some basses are really, really good at it, others not, so you can't really count on it. It would have been kind of cool, but it's sufficient to just have it doubling with contrabassoon, right? And now notice that I also vary the accompaniment or doubling of this pizzicato right in here and of its execution. So right in here, it appears as pizzicato divided between cellos and double basses, and it ends the same way. But in here, I just throw in a couple of notes, especially on the accents uh, of double bass, and jump over to tuba and bass trombone. And I figure that works really, really well as a good contrast, especially with bassoons doubling the violas right in there, and the melodic treatment as well in the strings, which I'll talk about in a minute. And then doubling by bassoons of the pizzicato works perfectly. 
Notice that I've decided to use second bassoon right in there. That really is their role, and it frees up the first to get ready to do these nice furious triplets. And then just a touch of second bassoon right in there, and going back to first. Here's a place where, with more careful editing, I would probably throw in the number one right there, one period, just to indicate that I was sticking with just first rather than ah two, because following two voices, I really should indicate whether or not I'm going back to one and which instrument and so on. Now, I could have also solved that problem by having a rest below in the second voice, and then that would indicate first voice above. Now, <laughs> let's talk about the treatment of the melody right in there. But before we can do that, we really have to go back to the beginning and talk about the melody all the way through. So that will tie together what I've talked about in this latter section, and then I'll talk a little bit about how I dealt with some of the interacting at the beginning all at the same time. We're coming back to this ba 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 da 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 dum idea, and I'm using the clarinets and bass clarinet to play this really cool harmony coming up from below while the horn is playing this solo, and I feel that that has this wonderful radiance on top and the slight chillingness of the clarinets from below, and of course the pointiness of the bassoons and pizzicato lower strings and then just doubling in the strings on the clarinets. So it has a lovely unearthly tone. So when this icy tremolo comes in with the glockenspiel above, it isn't cloying or cutesy. It is more spine tingling. When the horn ends, English horn takes over, as we mentioned before. And that's, of course, accompanied by the harp. And I talked about how that was a really great way of backing off on the texture. Now I'm coming back in with the texture. Here we have Arco now, kind of going back and forth with a little pizzicato on the main beats all the time with the double basses. And staccatissimo in our middle strings right in there. And that keeps the strings from interfering with this bass clarinet right in here. Yeah, we've got this lovely trombone solo, and that's all good, and people are going to be listening to it. But I really love the little creepiness of the bass clarinet coming through right in here. And really, this is what I'm thinking about more as an orchestrator than the trombone solo. Notice the dynamics right in here. Piano crescendo on the trombone, right? And then we've got the same dynamics in the accompaniment, but I've got the bass clarinet just really sticking out right in there and that will be a really great balance, the way that it's scored. And then, of course, we've got the little spine-tingling glockenspiel and tremolo from the violins. And as bassoon comes in and does the little answering solo, first bassoon, I return to the same idea with the harp, except not as big of a chord to follow because I've got these fingered tremolo thirds right in here. Okay, and then that leads to the triplets. Diana. Notice bass clarinet supporting the violas once again. And first oboe coming in right in here with the melody carrying forwards. And notice how carefully everything is balanced below the oboe. So, yeah, I've, I've got forte in the heart, but forte diminuendo and balancing with everything else, it'll work out great. So piano crescendo to forte and then backing off after the sforzando on the tenuto note right in here. That will balance really nicely with the clarinets doubling the violas and the jumping up and down of the pizzicato below it. Okay, <laughs> so next melody, first and second violins doubling and then of course cascading downwards kind of as an afterthought. This really isn't part of the melody, and perhaps the conductor might have them back off a little bit right in there if they are overwhelming right in there. If they come in like, say, a forte or a molto forte rather than just mezzo forte, they really should just be um, a little bit of icing on the cake as the first horn comes back in to play this ending part. And I feel first horn works really, really great, helping to wrap things up and prepare it for the big crashing slow bar 
to follow that leads into the next section. So that's my take on section B, and I really had enormous amounts of fun scoring this part. It was something where I really looked at the piano music and I was aware of the problems, but they seemed to just solve themselves as I scored. Lots of little bits and pieces like this little FE right in here in the contrabassoon, doubling the cellos below, going tremolo F to just standard E, fifth right in here. It all just made total sense to me when I scored it, and listening to the mock-up, that makes sense too. And of course, I'd love to hear an orchestra take a crack at this, but it really would take some practicing. It's some, there are some demands right in here, which I feel are reasonable for a professional orchestra, but would still take some work in rehearsal and also a bit of balancing from the conductor. So I hope you enjoyed that evaluation of the beginning of my orchestration. I will follow this up with a video on parts C and then going halfway through D. And then I'll have a third video taking the tutti from the middle of D all the way to the end of the piece. And then we'll get to talk a little bit more about that oboe de more solo at the end. Thanks everybody. Thanks so much to the patrons for supporting this challenge, which is giving, I don't know how many orchestrators yet, a chance to participate. And I'm just so excited now that I have finished this beginning part in terms of this lecture, I'm going to go check out my inbox and see if anybody has sent me any scores that I can take a look at. You guys are awesome. This is one of the funnest online communities to belong to. So productive, so artistic, and so many great people helping each other out to become greater artists. It's just really, really inspiring. Thank you all so much, and stay tuned for part two.